So now let's talk about reflexes. The first video on the muscle spindle was pretty short. Now we're going to talk about reflexes. Okay? And we're going to talk about two kind of simple reflexes and one complex. There are many of them, they're really, really interesting. Okay? But unfortunately, we don't have enough time. So first of all, the general idea, what is a somatic reflex? So when you see a word somatic, you should immediately think about skeletal muscle. It's actually a very typical response from nervous system. The only difference, so basically, let me explain. When I tell you, write this down, you do it in a conscious manner. You see what I'm saying? You can decide. You may write it down or may not. It's your decision. Reflexes are sort of independent from your decisions. Those are automatic responses from your skeletal muscles in this case. So you have some kind of a stimulus that is sensed by sensors. The information about that stimulus goes into the afferent neurons. And then one important thing happens, pay close attention. So your afferent neurons, they can synapse with the motor neurons, so efferent neurons, directly. Does that make sense? The idea of direct synapsing. That synapsing happens, so that part right here, that's your, that happens in the spinal cord. But alternatively, what can happen, your afferent neurons can synapse with so-called interneurons, which will relay the information from the sensor to the motor ones. And then motor neurons deliver the signal to the effector, which is, in this case, a skeletal muscle. Does that idea make sense about the reflex? Okay, this is your typical somatic reflex. So you can see here that <clears throat> your cortex is not involved in decision making. It all happens at the level of the spinal cord. Okay? Good? So we're going to discuss first reflex, which is going to be a stretch reflex. Using nature to reflex as an example. Okay? Everybody is more or less familiar what knee jerk reflex is, right? You know, you've been tested for this. I don't need to demonstrate, I'm not gonna be able to, but I don't need to like step on this thing and just demonstrate which will be, will be hugely inconvenient. Good. So this is how it works. So it all starts with the stretch of a muscle. In case of knee jerk reflex, we are talking about the quadriceps. Okay? So when physician tests your knee jerk reflex, he or she taps with a reflex hammer on the patellar tendon right here, okay? And that patellar tendon 
when it is being pressed, it stretches your quadriceps. Does that make sense? So for our example, it's going to be quads. Okay. So that stretch is sensed by muscle spindle in, well, it's actually spindles, multiple, okay, in the quads. And then the information goes, and I'm just laying out right here, step by step, goes into the afferent neuron. So far we good? Now afferent neuron, synopsis with efferent neuron, as we've already discussed, that synopsis happens in a that synopsis happens in the spinal cord. Okay? And then efferent neuron sends the information to the effector. So it's going to be contraction of a stretched muscle. So look. The physician taps you on the tendon, the stretch is sensed, the signal goes to the spinal cord. From the spinal cord, the response reaches that same quads, okay, quadriceps, and quadriceps contracts, and you have a knee jerk. Okay? You clear? Good? Not only this, you see this interneuron story? So something happens here as well. So afferent neuron also synopsis with an interneuron. All of this happens in the spinal cord. An interneuron further synopsis with another completely different efferent neuron. <laughs> See that? Which basically sends an inhibitory signal which results in the relaxation of an antagonist muscle. Which muscle is undoing whatever quadriceps do? Which muscle is an opposite to quadriceps? Your hamstrings, right? Make sense? So if we want to put this whole story together, the physician taps on your patellar tendon, the signal goes all the way to the spinal cord, okay, and in the spinal cord, efferent neurons essentially generate two motor outputs. One output, which is excitatory output, ends up uh, causing the contraction of your stretched muscle, and another inhibitory output causes the relaxation of antagonist muscle. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's your typical stretch reflex. Why it's important? We can, why reflexes are important? Because using stretch reflex, you can test the functionality, oh, sorry, functionality of the spinal cord, myelination of spinal neurons, so on and so forth. In some conditions, knee jerk reflex is um, inhibited in some conditions, it's hugely amplified, so physicians can use that. Okay, the story with the stretch reflex, bless you, does that make sense? Okay, good. Basically, uh, stretch reflex 
its role is to give an opportunity to, for a smooth transition from one movement to another. Does that make sense? Basically, uh, if you look at people who perform highly coordinated physical activities, basically gymnastics, like um, the, the vault exercises which require incredible amount of balance, they stretch reflexes in the muscles, are they muscle spindles incredibly sensitive. Okay? On the other hand, um, well, think of it this way. If you can inhibit stretch reflex, then you can stretch a muscle, and you potentially can stretch it beyond normal. If you ever look at the pitcher during the baseball game, uh, they shoulder does not move. I, I mean, it shouldn't move like that. Okay, it's abnormal. So practice essentially reduces the threshold of activation for the stretch reflex. They inhibit the stretch reflex. One of the best examples actually was brought out by a colleague of mine, Dr. Newsbaum, who, if you like, I don't know how many people in this room can do a split, the classic gymnastic split. So if you ever wondered why some can and some cannot, it's not because of anatomy differences. We all potentially can do a split. There is nothing anatomically that prevents us from doing that. But when we start stretching, okay, our muscle spindles send the signals. It's a typical stretch reflex, which immediately activates, immediately contracts the, um, the adductors of the thigh, and that's it. We can't move any further. By training, you can increase, basically inhibit that stretch reflex, increase the threshold of activation, and eventually do a split. Make sense? Okay. Now, Tendon reflex. So tendon reflex is more of a protective one, and it, as a matter of fact, senses not so much a stretch, but the degree of tension in the muscle, and it is higher threshold of activation. So, obviously the tension in the muscle, continued tension should rise to some threshold to activate tendon organ, which then through afferent neurons sends, a, sends the signal about the tension to the spinal cord. Afferent neurons in the spinal cord synapse with the efferent neurons now I'm actually quite happy that I had a chance to lay out tendon and stretch reflex side by side because you will see similarities and differences so if in a stretch reflex your stretched muscle contracts, in the tendon reflex your super tense muscle okay, does that make sense? tense muscle relaxes okay, and of course you're going to have this little interneuron story. Okay, so via interneuron, the signal will reach another set of efferent neurons. which will stimulate the slight contraction of antagonist muscle. Now, this may sound very, very 
very fundamental and basic. But here's a, a bit of an example. Um, after exercise, especially, you know, all kinds of exercises, your muscles feel tense. And one of the advice that's given is, you know, to stretch. So here's what, and there is a certain, you know, sort of mechanism of stretching. You have to stretch for an extended period of time, you have to hold it, you know. So basically, if I do this, and I start stretching my quadriceps, they become tense. Tendon organ senses that tension, and eventually it leads to the relaxation of my tense muscle. Does that make sense? By selectively applying tension after the exercise, you allow your muscles after the exercise to fully relax and to better recover. That's basically your physiological mechanism of what we call stretching, but we should call it actually tensing. Okay? Good? Make sense here? So those are two kind of fundamental reflexes that I wanted to compare. One more, which is more of a fun reflex, okay, uh, is called flexor cross extensor reflex. Now, first I'm going to demonstrate it because it's very, it's very visual, okay. And it's a very complex reflex, okay, but it's, it's really fun. So imagine, now I'm going to, since I have, I'm working on camera, I'm not going to bring anyone here to the stage, but here's the thing. Imagine that this, my watch, okay, is not a watch. It's somebody who grabbed me by an arm. You see what I'm saying? Like, I'm walking down the street, it's dark, somebody jumped at me behind, uh, you know, from around the corner and grabbed me right here. So what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to pull my hand back. Does that make sense? I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to punch that person in the face or push them away. Follow me? So essentially what happens is a reflex when somebody suddenly grabs me here, flexor, crossed across the body, extends it. Make sense? Um, I know this example mostly because of, you know, punching in the face, it's kind of fun, but more sort of realistic situation. If you are a parent and your kids like Lego, immediately know what I'm talking about. You walk into the kid's room and step on the Lego with your bare foot. Okay? What's going to happen? Let's say I step on the Lego with my right foot. I'm going to pull it up. That's your flexor. That makes sense? Simultaneously transferring my entire body weight on the opposite leg. So crossed extensor. I have to extend my opposite leg. Got it? Now, we're not going to go into the mechanics of which interneurons go where, but I really want you to appreciate which muscles contract in this response. And to answer this question, we're going to use the anatomical terminology, which is ipsilateral and contralateral. Remember, ipsilateral, same side, contralateral, opposite side. So when I all to the stimulus. So, to the stimulus. So, my watch is the stimulus. When I pull my arm towards myself, these muscles are flexors, right? These muscles are extensors. So, ipsilateral flexor. Okay. Is what I'm talking 
activated or inhibited. Ipsilateral flexor is what? Activated. And ipsilateral extensor is what? Obviously inhibited. So I can effectively pull my arm back. And if you think about what I'm doing on the other side here, I extend my arm. You with me so far? So, contralateral extensor is activated and contralateral flexor is inhibited. Okay, we're good? That's your kind of layout here. Not kind of, actual layout. Okay? So far, I'm doing all right. So these are reflexes. There are, I, I talk more about reflexes on lecture we talk about Babinski's sign, uh, the plantar reflex, the abdominal reflex. So basically there is a whole bunch of reflexes that physicians use in certain situations to check for the functionality of a spinal nerve or spinal cord, um, proper myelination of neurons. So basically like uh, in a child the Babinski sign, if you, if you draw the blunt object on the, the bottom of the foot in an adult, proper healthy adult, the fingers, the toes, are going to do this. They're going to curl. In a newborn, they're going to fan out. Okay? It's normal up until the age of about one because by one, age one, basically neurons are myelinated. If the child is like two and they're still fanning out, Houston, we have a problem. Okay? So, um, that's the thing. Questions? Okay, awesome.